Thank you, David. Good evening, everybody. And uh, unfortunately, we can't see each other face to face, which is a shame because I would have loved to see you all and actually see you in person. However, this is the closest we can get. And we really what we want to do is just to start our consultation by giving you some information and some communications to you. This is the beginning of our stage and we will be looking forward to having much more, more communication to you. Um, but first of all, what I need to say is that this EBA has been a very difficult EBA to negotiate. And the reason being is there hasn't been much money from the government to give us. Last time when we negotiated in 2015 and 16 was a lot easier because there was a lot more money in the budget. This time around, thanks to David Eden, our Assistant Secretary, and to Graham and Granger, our Senior Industrial Officer, they've done tremendous work to try and get you the best deal possible. The current policy of the government is wage increase of 1.5%. We managed to do 2%. Now, is it, you know, would we like more? Of course we would. We would like a lot more than this. But um, unfortunately, it's been a very, very strong battle for us to try and get the best we can for our members. However, what I would like to do, though, is to explain to you exactly what you get in and you know exactly what your entitlements will be. Um, there is some great increases for some of you, um, depending on your grades, and some grades will reach up to 16% increase, which is fantastic. So what I'll do is hand it over to David Eden, our Assistant Secretary, to give you a bit more details. At the end of this, if you thought of something that you thought, I wish I asked this question or I'm not quite sure about this, please send us an email and we'll respond back to you with the further responses to your questions. Until then, see you next time. Bye everyone. Thanks very much, Diana. That email address to send your questions into is info at hwu.org.au. So info at hwu.org.au. It's a bit of a central catchment point for the questions that are coming in in relation to the Enterprise Barn Agreement. And from there, we'll generate an outbound communication uh, with a frequently asked questions and answers sheet. So uh, what I might do is start with uh, the general uh, presentation and then we'll move into the specifics for um, the farms technicians. If we want to move to uh, the second page, thanks mate. So quite often what will happen is that uh, we as uh, you know, union officials will go out to our members and start discussing uh, the Fair Work Act and uh, various clauses in it and enterprise bargaining agreements and as though everyone has a clear understanding of what we're talking about, more often than not we see eyes glaze over and, uh, and people look as though, look at, looking at us as though we're speaking some kind of foreign language. So what I'll do is just strip it right back to basics about what enterprise bargaining is. Enterprise bargaining is um, enhancements on uh, the modern award. And the modern award, um, you cannot uh, have wages and conditions less than the modern award, but an enterprise bargaining agreement enhances the modern award. And I don't like to use the cake analogy there where the modern award is the cake and the enterprise bargaining agreement is the icing and the lollies and you know, everything else that goes on top. What we do when we come to bargaining is um, we engage with our members, we do surveys, we, we basically get a wish list of our members. In an ideal world, what would you like out of your enterprise bargaining agreement? But we're not the only ones that do that. The employers also do it. And a lot of members don't realise that, that employers go around and do a similar process across uh, all the hospitals in Victoria to work out what the employers would like to do uh, with your wages and conditions over the life of the next agreement. We end up tabling our uh, wish list and the employers table their wish lists and we start bargaining. And bargaining is sort of like um, selling a car privately where you'll always throw an extra a few hundred bucks on it. If someone doesn't come along and negotiate you down, hey, bonus for you, you've got an extra few hundred bucks on top that you thought you were going to get for the car, the more likely or not you're going to get someone come along and want to negotiate you down. Uh, what ends up happening is that you get exactly what you wanted for the car and the other person drives away thinking they've got the bargain of the century. So enterprise bargain, very similar, where we've got our wish lists, both of us uh, on the table, both groups, and we negotiate and we end up landing somewhere in the middle uh, during that process. Next slide, mate. So as Diana touched on, the government's wages policy, uh, tough. Uh, no union's been able to break it so far. The nurses had a really unusual arrangement under their previous agreement where they did an eight-year wage deal. That's just totally unheard of and uh, will now probably never happen again into the future. So that was uh, a little unusual, but uh, the health professionals 
They got 2.5% uh, wage increase, but what they did was what's known as a, wage, a, a rollover agreement. So they didn't negotiate anything at all in their enterprise bargaining agreement. They didn't try and approve any conditions or anything like that. They just said, give us the 2.5 and we'll see you in 12 months time. So a 2.5% rollover deal lasts for 12 months. If I was a health professional right now, I'd be pretty damn angry because they're coming back to the negotiating table and the government's new wages policy is 1.5%. So they've been absolutely dudded uh, by the 2.5% rollover. So no union's been able to break uh, the 2% uh, government wages policy, but there are other opportunities under the wages policy and uh, wage pillar three is one of those opportunities for us. And uh, you've probably heard Wage Pillar 3 uh, tossed around a little bit. You've probably seen it in your communication that we sent out as well. What is Wage Pillar 3? It's, it's where we can get extra funding if we can um, align with another government uh, policy or, um, or, um, or priority. And the TAFE system is a really good example of a uh, state government priority. They've invested a lot of money in the TAFE system. It's not doing as well as they would like. And we're able to present a number of classifications uh, as part of this bargaining process to get extra money because we can uh, create career path opportunities and put, put more people through TAFE, getting formal qualifications, supporting their other government priority. The other area that we're able to get additional access uh, uh, to that uh, pillar three is where there has been a classification that hasn't been reviewed for some time through enterprise bargaining and the cook and chef structure is a really good example of where they have not had a classification review since the mid 80s and uh, we're able to leverage uh, on pillar three to improve their classification structure to modernize it to reflect modern uh, commercial cooking requirements and all the rest of it the other area where we can ad access additional funds is where we can demonstrate that men and women working exactly the same role in this, with the same employer for the um, you know, same length of time, uh, retiring with, with lot less uh, money in the superannuation account, uh, being a female than a male, and, uh, and, and where we've been able to demonstrate that we've been able to get additional funds uh, as well. So next slide, thanks, Bob. So kicking off, uh, we've managed to negotiate an extra week's annual leave for all employees. So if you're currently a Monday to Friday worker uh, and get four weeks annual leave, you're going to go to five weeks annual leave a year. And if you're a shift worker and you're currently receiving five weeks annual leave a year, you're going to get six weeks annual leave a year. Now, the nurses have had this in their agreement for quite some time and the medical scientists negotiated this and I, I think the pharmacists themselves uh, might have negotiated this uh, last agreement. I know the medical scientists certainly did, but the pharmacists may have also got this in their agreement last time where they got the additional week's leave. But there is uh, some negotiation. Uh, there is a trade-off to get the additional week's annual leave. How it will work uh, is that at the moment, if you work a public holiday, you get paid two and a half times your ordinary rate. Under the new proposal, you will get double time. If you're a full-time employee and you're on a rostered day off that a, that a public holiday falls on, you get paid time and a half. In the new agreement, you'll get paid single time. The rostered day off benefit uh, for a part-time employee if you would ordinarily work the day of the week that the public holiday falls on and you're rostered off, you get paid time and a half. Uh, that is only if you ordinarily work it. Under the new agreement, you'll get whatever your average hours are for that day paid at your usual rate. So regardless of whether you work would ordinarily work that day of the week or not, uh, as a part-time employee, you will get paid a public holiday benefit uh, for that day. But what's happening is that more and more employers are employing people on a part-time basis. Uh, there's electronic clock on, clock off systems. They're manipulating the rosters to ensure that there is few people as possible getting the rostered off benefit. And uh, what's also happening is that regardless whether you're part-time or full-time, uh, you work, uh, your, your roster days off are on Monday, Tuesday, and the public holidays on Wednesday. The employer approaches you and said, look, it's going to be pretty quiet in the hospital on Wednesday. It's a public holiday. Have the day off. So that's not a rostered day off. That's an additional day off. And that's getting paid at single time. And uh, that will continue to apply as well at single time. 
So there is a uh, there is a trade off to get the additional weeks annual leave. It is the public holiday uh, uh, rostered off uh, penalty and the rostered on penalty. Uh, but we are seeing fewer and fewer members getting a rostered off uh, penalty um, uh, for, for public holidays anyway. Next slide, thanks, buddy. Long service leave after seven years. Uh, well, we, we're getting uh, our older workforce in the hospitals replaced by a younger workforce. They're more transient, less likely to stay with the same employer for 10 years or more and get access to long service leave. What we've managed to do is negotiate uh, long service leave access after seven years. So the nurses had their enterprise bond agreement certified only two months ago. So hot off the presses, we grabbed their clause and dropped it into our agreement. So word for word, it's the same as theirs where uh, if you, as of 1 July this year, work nine years, you have access to long service leave pro rata under the state long service leave act. Next year, you'll have access to long service leave pro rata after eight years and the following year and thereafter, you'll have access to long service leave uh, after seven years uh, in line with the state long service leave act at 10 years. Uh, you click up to the um, pre-modern award entitlement. What's the difference between the State Long Service Leave Act and the, and the pre-modern award entitlement? It's 13 weeks uh, under the uh, State Act and it's uh, 17 weeks under your pre-modern award. So it's an extra four weeks. But um, if we're offering uh, long service leave after seven years, we might hopefully see uh, younger people uh, have a break and stay in the, in the health industry longer, or they might want to use uh, or access their long service leave to advance their um, qualifications and training in the health industry. Next slide, thanks. Uh, how would you like a monthly ADO? So what we're seeing is that more and more employers are replacing full-time employees who leave uh, with part-time employees. And what really frustrates us is when we see uh, people engaged to do 37 and a half hours a week. Uh, why do employers do that? It's so they don't have to pay them an ADO. So what we've done in this agreement is uh, anyone who's currently working 37 hours a week or more can request that the employer provides them with a rostered system of work that gives them an ADO once a month. It doesn't mean to say you work your 37 hours a week and you get an ADO once a month. You've got to work 40 hours a week and you get your rostered off benefit once a month. So um, the government didn't see this as a cost item. Uh, it's basically you're there for the same amount of hours. Uh, it's a way of um, the way you roster. So we're going to see uh, it is a small cost because um, employers are going to have to employ uh, you for that little extra uh, amount of hours to bring you up full time, but uh, this is a huge outcome uh, or benefit for our members. Next slide, thanks, Mark. Workload is an absolutely massive problem across the health industry. It's not just uh, you know pharmacy technicians or the cleaners. It's uh, you know the AMA have issues with this with their uh, with their doctors. Uh, workload is uh, a real problem in the public health sector. So what we've managed to do, this union's been working with WorkSafe Victoria over the last two years to develop a uh, workplace guidance uh, for fatigue management. And what we've done is we've embedded that fatigue guidance into the enterprise bargaining agreement. What's guidance material, I hear you ask? Well, um, employers, if they adopt everything that's set out in that guidance material, would be considered to be occupational health and safety compliant. If they don't adopt what's in the um, fatigue guidance, they are not considered to be occupational health and safety compliant and can be prosecuted by WorkSafe. WorkSafe was so excited to see this guidance material uh, embedded into our enterprise bargaining agreement. So now if you've got workload issues, you can have it addressed through this clause. And uh, in the past, what's happened is that in, in, employees have approached or members have approached their employer and said, look, we've got some workload issues uh, going on. I want, them, I want them sorted. And they'll say, yeah, we'll deal with it through the grievance procedure, which means that you continue to you know, be exposed to the workload issues until the grievance is resolved. Not anymore. Uh, they've got to deal with it and deal with it very quickly. Otherwise, they're in breach of uh, the guidance material put out by WorkSafe to deal with uh, workplace fatigue. Next slide. Thanks, Bob. 
Uh, if you are a, a health and safety representative in regional Victoria, we recommend Be Safe as the training provider out there. If you're a health and safety representative in uh, metropolitan areas, we recommend uh, Victorian Trades Hall Council. If you are an elected health and safety rep, you're entitled to five days uh, training at the employer's expense as well as all your uh, paid uh, time to be there. And you're also entitled to one day update every year as a health and safety representative. If you do not have a health and safety representative uh, in your department, I, um, I, I suggest you reach out to the um, organiser that you have and ask them how to go about having a health and safety election. It's really important to have a health and safety rep and a deputy health and safety representative in your areas. Uh, so um, there's also going to be additional benefits uh, for health and safety representatives under this agreement. So if you go to the next slide, thanks, mate. This idea come about uh, when I spent some time working at St John of God in Ballarat, one of the best employers I've ever worked for, and they're very, very safety conscious. And uh, what happened was I was elected as a health and safety rep within my unit. Uh, I went off and did my five-day basic course. I come back with, you know, lots of enthusiasm and uh, made sure that everything that needed to be regularly serviced or maintained was getting done. Uh, any training that staff needed to operate particular bits of equipment or do particular procedures uh, was all up to scratch. And uh, it was a really proactive role. It was fantastic. And what happened was I was approached by the health and safety manager of St John of God and said, would you like to come over and work with me in the health and safety department once a fortnight on a secondment basis? And that means he just borrows me from my uh, usual boss for one day a fortnight. So if you can tee it up with my boss, uh, sounds good. So uh, what ended up happening was that I'd spend one day a fortnight working in the health and safety department, but I wasn't the only health and safety representative that was working over in that uh, OHS department. Uh, there was a number of OHS reps, including the uh, chef. Uh, she often was over there at the same time as me. And it took me a while to work out why he was getting health and safety representatives over there to work with him in the health and safety department. And that was that he, the guy wasn't from the health department industry at all he was a health and safety manager sure he, had, sure he had qualifications and experience but he had no idea what was happening in the in the hospital environment and that rings true with a lot of our occupational health and safety managers i think across uh, the hospitals uh, in victoria so what he was doing is he was picking our brain he, he was being educated by us about the types of risks that were involved in these departments and we together worked on uh, policies and procedures that would protect employees working in those environments. But he just wasn't learning from us. We also had a great opportunity to learn from him. And um, what happened was that the uh, health and safety representative from the kitchen uh, enrolled in the certificate for an occupational health and safety. And when that manager eventually retired, uh, she replaced him as a health and safety manager. So I think it's a really good opportunity uh, for our OHS representatives to go on and, and potentially uh, spend some time in the health and safety department, get enthusiastic, do your Cert 3, your Cert 4, or your diploma in OHS. And I hopefully will see the day where our members are running health and safety across hospitals in Victoria and not as many people are getting injured. Next slide, thanks, Bob. So none of us getting any younger, um, you know, workplace injuries sometimes creep up on us. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, not, they're not just a laceration or a cut or a bruise or a broken bone or whatever. It could be a worn out joint through repeated stress injuries and uh, people are still arriving. So it's popping, popping them in. So sometimes they creep up over time. And as I said before, too, we've got an aging workforce um, and we've had a number of members in recent times uh, who have gone in to represent uh, who have actually got early onset Alzheimer's as well and got memory issues. So um, instead of um, employers putting people under a performance improvement plan uh, because they're not able to do the job as well as they used to, um, if it's been identified that they're um, actually got a disability and that might be an acquired disability through you know years of doing the same job and you've got joints that were worn out and, and a PSA is a really good example of where they might have been able to make 30 beds a day uh, for the last 30 years but guess what things are worn out and they're only able to do 15 now 
these scenarios are not going to be dealt with under a performance improvement plan any longer. Where it's been identified as part of the investigation process that you have a disability, it's going to be dealt with under the disability clause in the enterprise bargain agreement. The employers are going to have to make reasonable adjustments uh, to your job to enable you to continue your employment with that organisation. So you won't be performance improved out of the place because you've got an injury that you've probably got from that workplace in the first place. They're going to have to provide you with supports to maintain uh, your employment with that employer. Next slide, thanks, mate. The Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor, you, there is one in every single hospital in Victoria. We negotiated those positions under your current agreement and under the new agreement, they're going to pick up some additional responsibilities. At the moment, they're purely there to train you and provide you with opportunities to advance your career in the health industry. But the two additional tasks that they're going to be allocated is where a position has been deemed as redundant by the employer, the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor will get involved at the earliest possible time for possible uh, retraining and redeployment to keep these people employed. But the other area that they'll be um, also focusing on is where an employee has suffered a workplace injury and they're not able to re return to their pre-injury job. Uh, they'll be involved in uh, retraining and redeployment for those individuals as well. This is about people keeping people in jobs, not just throwing them on the scrap heap. Next slide, thanks, mate. This agreement will provide an additional 15 EFT in workplace trainer careers advisor positions across the state of Victoria. That isn't 15 people, it could be uh, 20 or 30 people, uh, but it's 15 EFT. So there's currently 30 EFT across the state, we're moving to 45 EFT across the state of Victoria. Some of those positions are part-time now, they'll move to full-time positions as a result of the additional EFT. Uh, some hospitals share a workplace trainer careers advisor over a number of uh, networks that will reduce uh, to you know, more career advisor workplace trainers. Uh, to um, provide more opportunity, more time directly to our members uh, to help them with their careers in the health industry. Next slide, thanks, Matt. So um, I don't know, you've probably all heard the story where you've gone to your employer and say, oh, look, I'd like to have some study leave, please. And they'll ask, what's it got to do with your current role within our organisation? You'll go, well, I, I wanted to change uh, what I was doing in the hospital. I want to try and do something else. Uh, and you get knocked back. It's like, well, it's got nothing to do with your job you're currently doing. Yeah, you're currently a food and domestic services assistant in the kitchen. If you wanted to do a Cert 3 in commercial cooking, we might be able to support that. But God forbid, if you were a food and domestic service assistant who wanted to become an allied health assistant, well, employers are not going to be able to deny uh, access to study leave uh, in this new agreement where it uh, relates to the health industry. There's also going to be better flexibilities built into the study leave clause where uh, employees are going to be able to request a flexible work arrangement where they attend uh, university on particular days of the week or at particular times. Uh, or it might be that they have a clinical placement at the end of their study and they'd like to access um, uh, some uh, additional leave or time off to um, complete that clinical placement. We've also set up um, a, uh, in, it's a, unqualified employees will receive two payments of $250 per year to incentivize them into participating in education. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a education incentive allowance and it will be paid twice a year to unqualified employees. So that's a, that's a, quite often we see um, the lowest paid employees who are unqualified, unskilled labour in the hospital. Uh, they have a number of hurdles to get over to go and do further education and have a career. And one of the biggest hurdles is that, look, sure, the course I'm enrolled in uh, is free, but I still have to buy my course materials or it's online. I need to buy a computer. I don't have the funds to do it. So this is to help those uh, who are in that situation, uh, they can access or will have, have be paid by um, paid the uh, $250 twice a year, so March and uh, again in uh, September, uh, $250 to help them with their education. Uh, next slide, thanks. Now, 
this is pretty huge. Now, not only will the employers have to pro provide you with your super contribution every four weeks instead of every three months as currently legislated. So uh, that compounding interest is better off in your super account than uh, in, their, uh, their, in their bank account. So every four weeks, you'll have a super contribution uh, made by your employer. But as of 1 July, if you're planning to have a family and taking some parental leave, you'll receive super, super uh, contributions for the entire 12 months that you're on parental leave. So you obviously have three months paid parental leave, but this is also on the unpaid component of your parental leave. And how it's going to be worked out is that the employers will look at your income on the preceding 12 months before you went off on parental leave, and they'll make contributions into your superannuation every four weeks as though you're still at work. This will go a long way to addressing uh, the shortfalls that women are having come retirement in their superannuation. As I said before, same job, same hourly income, come retirement, they're retiring with a lot less in their superannuation than men. And a lot of it has to do with the fact uh, that they take time off, they take parental leave. So this is huge. Uh, and I think other unions are latching onto this now as part of their claims. And uh, I hope they're as, uh, as successful as we are with our negotiations to get it in for their uh, membership. Next slide, thanks, Bill. Now, we don't get a lot of disputation around the pharmacy technicians. Uh, pharmacy techs is pretty clear what, what you, um, your classification is, but there, there are, uh, other classifications in our agreement that um, the definitions are a little um, broad and uh, what happens is that uh, you know, we eventually have to take it off the Fair Work Commission because the employers aren't budging. Uh, we wait months for a commission hearing, uh, depending on what side of the bed the commissioner gets out of on that particular day as to his attitude towards the case right there. And then uh, they hear both sides of the argument and then they'll take it away. And, you know, three or four months later, they'll finally hand down some kind of decision. Sometimes it goes our way, sometimes it goes the employer's way. But most of the time it's made by a commissioner that has no health industry understanding whatsoever. The industry review panel, and we're not going to be the only union that's going to be part of this. The nurses have already signed up to it as well, where um, it's going to be chaired by an independent person, uh, most likely a retired commissioner with a health industry background. Uh, only union members will be able to access the industry review panel and, uh, and the employers will be represented by VHIA. And we basically go there, we represent the members uh, case uh, before the industry review panel, as does the employer get represented by VHIA and the independent uh, uh, chair hands down their decision. The idea is that the industry review panel will be meeting monthly and if we have any disputes arise around classifications, uh, we can take it to the industry review panel and get it dealt with very, very quickly and by someone who knows the health industry. Next slide, thanks Mike. Um, just before we jump into the one specific for the pharmacy technicians, I might just play a really quick video of the Workplace Trainer Careers Advisor, uh, which captures everything they should be doing uh, in your hospital and what uh, their roles are going to be expanded to cover in the new agreement. I don't think that's going to work, Jose. I think uh, everyone's uh, gone home for the evening and uh, started streaming uh, movies off of Netflix or whatever. So we might just skip uh, that video, I think.
You set it up and you knock it down. You're all set now to rock this town. You don't really need to play it low. Just get up and go. This is all your show. You should know I believe in you. Every race you run, you're my number one. Kick it up now and bring it on. This will be your day. Cause baby, you are born. Yeah, we did have a bit of uh, video freezing there, but it, what's even more embarrassing is when I freeze, it's always when I'm pulling the most weirdest of faces. But anyway, uh, on with the presentation specifically for pharmacy technicians now. And if we go to uh, the second slide, the nauseous allowance. Thanks very much, mate. So what we did under the previous agreement is that um, the, the payment of nauseous allowance was very sketchy. Uh, some employers were paying it, some em employers weren't, depending on, um, you know, there might have been some sweet art deals done, but fewer and fewer employers were actually paying the nauseous allowance. And I'll give you a really good example where we've got our laundry hands working in the dirty uh, area of the laundry where all the filthy linen comes in. I can tell you, I've been up there and had a look and it's filthy. And uh, the employers um, said, well, how the nauseous allowance is defined is where you're doing work of an unusually dirty or offensive nature, having regard for the job that you do. And uh, this is the job they do. So they're not entitled to nauseous allowance. So more and more employers were arguing uh, that position. Uh, also, uh, some people were receiving it on an hourly basis, some were getting paid on a daily basis, and others were getting paid on a weekly basis. So it was all over the place. So what we did was go, okay, how much across the board is being paid as nauseous allowance now? This is the bucket. And what we then did was evenly distributed across um, all the classifications that we felt ought to have been receiving the nauseous allowance. We grossed it up to uh, two payments over the previous agreement, but what came through loud and clear with our, um, uh, our survey to our members was that they wanted to receive it more frequently than that. So what we've done is made it an annual payment. And what will happen is that employees, including pharmacy technicians, will be receiving uh, $350 a year nauseous allowance, which will be paid on uh, 1 December each year. So just before Christmas, there'll be a nice little uh, bonus there, which will particularly help those uh, like cleaners and uh, laundry hands who are um, you know, very lowly paid and uh, could be the difference between putting uh, Christmas dinner on or not. So uh, $350 a year nauseous allowance each year in the agreement. The next slide, uh, the education incentive allowance. That will be um, for pharmacy technician grade ones. So pharmacy technician grade ones will qualify for the education incentive allowance. This year, it will be a grossed up amount of 500, which will be most likely in September, just depends on when the agreement gets uh, voted up and, uh, and certified. Uh, but each year after that, it will be a $250 amount paid in March and then again in September. As I said, these education receive allowances are, are to be paid to those who are absolutely at the bottom of the run when it comes to wages and, uh, and they've, they've struggled to you know, uh, cover course costs like um, you know, materials and, and um, computers and things like that. So that's a great uh, initiative for our membership uh, to help those who are really, really poorly paid to get that little extra in their pocket um, to help pay for their education. And as I said, pharmacy technicians grade ones qualify for, for that payment. Uh, next slide, thanks, mate. The wages outcome for pharmacy technicians, and um, our, what we we're well on our way of um, creating a new definition and classification structure for pharmacy technicians. And um, what happened was that the uh, federal government announced a review of the uh, pharmacy technician uh, qualifications 
uh, through the pharmacy qualification framework. So the pharmacy technicians specifically working in hospitals, uh, they were um, also asking for submissions for that. I actually sent it out to all the pharmacy tech members that we have across Victoria, hoping that some of you guys would be able to put in a submission around that to say what's actually happening in the hospital environment now and what you'd like to see uh, in your formal qualifications. And I hope some of you took the time to make some submissions into that. So that sort of put a halt to the, the, uh, the exploring the classif new classification structure for you guys. So the employers said, well, look, we're not prepared to have a new definition that might well contradict uh, what's coming out of the federal government review uh, with training requirements and, and education and all the rest of it. So what we have agreed to is that um, once the uh, federal government has handed down uh, their uh, recommendation or their decision on you know, future training requirements for pharmacy techs working in hospitals, we will create an entirely new pharmacy technician classification structure incorporating in uh, all of that uh, detail. And it will be introduced in the new enterprise bargaining agreement. So the one after this one we're discussing now. What we have been able to do is uh, do some wages alignments. And surprisingly, um, I was thinking the pharmacy technicians were a little further behind uh, the rest of the um, classifications and what they were. Uh, the pharmacy technician grade one was uh, behind other uh, similar technicians and allied health assistants. Uh, so that's why they've got the extra boost of 12.2% over the life of the agreement. Pharmacy technician grade one's got 8.7, pharmacy technician grade three is 8.6, and the pharmacy technician grade four is 8.2 over the life of the agreement. And as I said, the, the government wages policy um, is uh, 2%, uh, and that's, that's in, in its entirety. Uh, with the additional um, allowances, weekend, uh, the additional weeks annual leave, and the uh, additional payments into uh, superannuation. Uh, for parental leave uh, that certainly comes well above the government wages policy. So uh, the final slide is just the industry review panel. We've already ticked off on that. So um, I see that uh, there hasn't been too many questions come through, but what I might do is hand over to Cameron now uh, to go through the questions and answers. Thanks, Cameron.